Coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. We have three fasting goals. And when you know what the fasting goals are, you can understand why it's important to fast clean. The first one is you want to keep your insulin low. You know, we talked about hyperinsulinemia is a problem. You know, insulin is not bad. We have to have it. You don't want to have high levels of circulating insulin all the time. It's linked to so many negative health outcomes. I didn't even really realize how many until when I was writing Fast Feast Repeat, I came across a research paper on hyperinsulinemia and it listed all the things that were associated with, with having chronic high levels of insulin. So this is so important for all of us. Um, so you want to avoid anything that is going to trick your body into thinking food is coming. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed podcast host and author, Jen Stevens. We discussed all things fasting and dove deep into the following topics. We discussed her eating and fasting routine, the importance of controlling insulin, gut health and fasting, what's a clean fast, and the importance of knowing your fasting goals. Lastly, we touched on her one tip to get your body back to what it once was. I really enjoyed my interview with Jen Stevens, and I know you will too. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the interview. All right. Welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. My name is Brian Grin, and I have Jen Stevens on. Welcome to the show, Jen. Hey, I'm so glad to be here this morning. Well, it could be any time when people are listening, but it's morning for us. <laughs> yes, yes. Morning for us. You have your coffee. I have my boxed water. Yep, I got got my black coffee. You know, only nowadays can you get, you know, water in any type of thing that you want. It's in a That's box. True. Yes. And I ordered it online and it came with, I ordered, I don't know, 20 of them, but it was in a box. There was like four boxes until you got to the actual water that was in a box. So... That's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> like those little Russian yeah. nesting dolls, you know, that you have to keep unwrapping. I was like, well, what's <laughs> this? And then there's like another box. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, and then we got to the bottom, like, oh, we got water in a box. So anyway. awesome. Um, Jen is the author of Delay, Don't Deny. She's got a bunch of books, actually. Fast Without Fear, right? And... Feast Without Fear. Yeah. Oh, feast, feast without fear. I, write, I like, oh, maybe you should come out with fast without fear. Well, you know, I, I do want you to, I want you to fast without fear and I want you to feast without fear. Yeah, no, right. And then most recently in June, fast, feast, and repeat. Right. Fast, feast, repeat. I'm so proud of that one. That um, My other books are all self-published. And so the new one, I actually am with um, St. Martin's Press of Macmillan. So it's thrilling mm. to have a book in traditional publishing channels as well. Yeah. No, that's great. Was the process a lot different when you Oh, it's a... so much so mm -hmm. much different when you're self-publishing. Things move so much quicker. You know, and and when I self-published my first book and um you know, I, I it finally showed up event you know, December 31st of 2016, but it was very quick from start to finish because it was all me. And when I first, you know, hit that publish button, you know, there were a couple typos, but you can fix them immediately. You fix right. the typo, you click publish again. Now it's fixed because they're all published on, you know, print on demand nowadays when you're right. self-publishing. Whereas with the, um, with the traditional book, you know, we had editors and me and other proofreaders and still the final one had some, some mistakes that I found when I was reading it out loud for the, um, the audible version. And I immediately let my editor know, she's like too late. We're already in line for the printer. I'm like, what? Mm. <laughs> they hadn't even printed them yet. So the oh first 10,000 had a couple of mistakes, but they fixed them. So now if you're buying them, they do not have those mistakes. That worries people. They're like, am I getting mistake? No, you're not getting mistakes. They were mild typos, <laughs> but it's such a process, you know, takes a how, long time. Yeah, how, how, well, how long did it take from start to finish? Well, from start to finish, I think that we initially, you know, got the contract going in maybe April of 2019. So it took all the way until June of 2020 for that book to oh. get out into the world. Okay. That's exciting. It is. And you're also a podcast host. I was actually on your podcast, Intermittent yes, Fasting Stories. Uh, this is a few years ago. Um, and you're still going with that, which is mm -hmm. great because I think it's so important to get other people's stories out there 
And that's, you know, people want to hear, well, have other people done it? And um, I'm, I guess we, we'll start with that as far as um, intermittent fasting stories. And my thought, my question for you is, are there certain stories that maybe you've done or interviews that you've done this year or in past years that sort of you're like, wow, those were just unbelievable stories. There are a few that sort of stick out. You know, really at the end of every everyone I record, I'm like, wow, that was awesome. I love talking to people. You know, just yesterday I interviewed episode 140. We have one every week. So that's how many weeks I've been doing, <laughs> doing it. <laughs> and um, I talked to a um, ex-pro football player who, you know, oh. uses intermittent fasting. He's a podcaster himself. And every story has something in there that is remarkable. Um, you know, there's some stories where people have, you know, like story that you, you cry when you're hearing it, you know, like loss of a child or, you know, they've been through cancer, or, you know, so many different things like that. But every story has the same theme. You know, we've struggled with our weight. We've struggled with our health. We've tr- struggled with our body image and intermittent fasting has allowed people it allowed me, but it's allowed my guests to get back in touch with their body in a new way and heal from, you know, the years of dieting, the body image problems, the, um, you know, the health issues. So it's, it's a story that, that is, you know, about the physical aspect of it, but there's so much mental and emotional healing that goes on with intermittent fasting. You know, I would, I would say that, you know, I didn't have an eating disorder like anorexia or bulimia or anything like that, but I think I had disordered eating for years because I was always going from diet to diet. I was restricting one thing or another thing. And only with intermittent fasting, have I been able to stop all those diet diety kind of thoughts and really get in tune with my body and I choose to eat foods that make me feel great, not because a diet plan told me to, but because now I can finally hear my body saying, yes, we would like some Brussels sprouts today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think becoming in touch with like what true hunger is, mm-hmm. is such a huge thing. And also understanding that, you know, you might have some hunger pains, but they, 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 they come and go, these waves right. come and go. And I think understanding that, um, is something so important. And when you start fasting, this is when you start to become in tune with that. It's true. You know, I think back to, you know, my pre intermittent fasting days, and I was one of those people that had snacks in my purse, just in case I was hungry. And, you know, I always tried to do intuitive eating because I really believe in that. But, you know, now I understand that all the, you know, the fake foods and the processed foods that we eat mess with our satiety signals. So your, your body doesn't get the nutrients it needs when you eat that little cracker snack pack. So you're hungry immediately, but I was eating, you know, first thing in the morning, then I would have a mid morning snack. Then I would have lunch, then a mid afternoon snack an afternoon latte dinner, something else. I, and I really honestly felt hungry all the time. Mm -hmm. And so now with intermittent fasting, I might have a, you know, a stomach growl or a wave of, Oh, I could eat, but it passes quickly. And I'm less hungry during the day than when I was eating frequently. That's the part that blows people's minds when they finally, finally do it that, Oh, I'm not hangry. You know, back when I was (laughs) eating frequently, I would get hangry. You know, if it was time to eat and my husband was late to the table or we were going out, I was like, come on, I got to eat. I'm starving. But now I'm like, all right, I can wait. It'll be fine. Right. Yeah. So true. I, I, I love it because it just gives you flexibility. Right. And I talked about this once before, but like traveling is, you know, one of these things I know maybe a lot of people didn't travel this past year, but in general, whether it's a road trip or going on an airplane, such a great time to fast because, um, for one, you don't know uh, the sources of your food a lot of times, Mm -hmm. and it's a lot of just junk and fast food. And it's like, I think in the past, like you said, you used to grab things from your purse. I remember, I think I, I think I might've overdosed on kind bars at one point. Oh yeah. (laughs) You know, just like, (laughs) Oh, you feel some hunger coming on. Oh, well time to eat something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just think that flexibility also just every, on an everyday basis, as far as just like, I'm a lot more productive. Um, cause like meals take time, especially if you're, you know, especially if you're preparing, um, what type of meals do you like to prepare for yourself, uh, throughout the day? Well, you know, I generally don't, um, open my eating window until, I mean, it could be one o'clock, two o'clock, four o'clock, six o'clock. It just depends on my daily schedule. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yesterday, for example, I was really busy 
and I didn't have a chance to open my window till probably four 30. I had a little, I, we had some, um, really good potato soup the night before. And you see, I'm not afraid of carbs, right, right. <laughs> but yeah, you know, yeah. I made it from scratch. I, I, yeah. I like to cook at home. And so I started with cutting up potatoes, you know, it was a high quality potato soup. So I had a bowl of potato soup to open my window. And then later I had dinner. I had a great piece of filet mignon with, um, we had some broccolini and um, some oven roasted potatoes. Yes, I had potatoes twice <laughs> and um, a homemade roll. I, I like to make my own bread. So, um, you know, and then I had a, for dessert, I had a, a really high quality, like a smoothie um, that I split with my husband, just a little bit of something sweet. Um, and and that, that was all I ate for the day, but I was full. I was satisfied. Whereas another day I might, you know, like today, I, since I ate so much later last night, I might be hungry at two mm. and I might have, you know, I might start, um, my day with a, a bowl of soup again, you know, something with some beans in it. I eat a lot of beans, you know, beans mm-hmm. and kale and tomato and a broth, something like that with a little Parmesan on there. Yeah. See, um, it's interesting because, you know, some people have trouble handling beans or kale or right. things like that. I mean, I know there's, like a big movement. I've had a bunch of interviews with a lot of keto carnivore is, is sort of a big, uh, big thing, but you know, like with yourself, you know, you're metabolically flexible, you right. can handle carbs. And, and if you are metabolically flexible, I wouldn't, like you said, you, you shouldn't be afraid of carbs. Um, having rises in insulin, it's, it's a normal thing as long exactly. as you come back to like a baseline, right? Right. Exactly. You know, we, we know that we don't want to have high levels of insulin all the time. Hyperinsulinemia is not a good state to be in. Right. And, you know, back in the day when I was eating all the time around the clock, drinking a lot of diet sodas, I, um, you know, yeah, I was drinking those with stevia. So it felt like a good choice, but it was still, you know, sweetness coming in all the time. You know, my body was cranking out the insulin in response. I was putting, you know, sweeteners in my coffee, creamy coffee all the time. I was eating, you know, my, I I did not have my insulin tested back then, but I was obese. I weighed 210 pounds at at my heaviest um, back in 2014. And I'm sure I had um, really high levels of insulin. I had abdominal obesity, you know, my, I was an apple shape at the time, you know, now my, my waist is, you know, 27 inches. So I'm, I'm a healthy shape. I've lost over 80 pounds. And I've maintained the loss ever since um, 2015, thanks to intermittent fasting. And you see, I, I do, I eat lots of, of carby things, but what I'm not eating is a lot of ultra processed food. Um, I'm eating real food. You know, the potatoes that I cut up, I kept the peel on and, you know, our gut microbiomes are amazing. You know, people who might have um, issues that you can heal. Basically, um, Dr. Ruscio, I'm not saying, I don't think I said his name right. Ruscio. Yeah, I, think the, I think you did say that. Right? Okay. Yeah. I'm just talking out of the top of my head. He <laughs> has, we had him on the intermittent fasting podcast a few oh. years ago um, when he, one of his gut books came out and he talked about how, you know, that's, that's his, you know, he's a gut doctor mm-hmm. and he talked about how the gut can heal. So his goal is not to eliminate foods forever with his patients, but to eliminate what's giving you trouble, let your gut heal. So, a, you know, a healthy body can eat all the foods. So if, if you're not tolerating the foods, there's something going on. And so um, I really believe that a lot of us can reintroduce things as we become healthier, you know, real foods. I'm not talking about reintroducing Twinkies, you know, right. <laughs> they're not going to help your gut. Yeah. Yeah, I just uh, interviewed a, another gentleman um, yesterday, and he had issues with. Well, he eliminated everything, and sometimes you want to do somewhat somewhat of an elimination diet, perhaps right. if you are having issues um, like dairy, for example. He was getting really dry skin, mm-hmm. and it was like the one thing he added on. So then he realized, okay, no more dairy. Um, is that so- for you? Do you incorporate dairy into your diet? I, you know, dairy works great for me. Okay. Um, I actually. You know, I I know the science of, you know, DNA and what foods work for you is still really in its infancy. And, you know, the latest research is showing it's really more the gut than it is your DNA. But that being said, um, dairy intolerance, actually, you can trace that back to DNA. And about 75% of people or something like that do have that genetic, you know, dairy probably isn't going to be, you know, it's good for you. I'm fortunately in that 25%. Right. Um, and so much of it really has to do with your, um, your genetics, where your ancestors came from and what they ate. You know, we did 
develop, um, you know, we adapted to our environments, you know, our, our bodies did. So I, I think that that's, if you think dairy is a problem for you, you're probably in that 75% who are not as genetically adapted. Yeah. And, um, I, I was looking a little bit through your website and you talk a lot about a clean fast. Right. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about, um, cause people are like, Oh, can I have this? Can I have that? I just did a podcast on it. You know, does coffee break a fast? And I know you're having your coffee right here. I am. <laughs> well, how would you, how would you describe a clean fast? Well, I have, um, actually two chapters on this in fast feast repeat, because that's how important it is. The first one is, you know, why we fast clean. And I talk about, we have three fasting goals and I'll get into that. Mm -hmm. And then the second clean fasting chapter is, you know, what you can have during the fast and why. So I'll answer that part first, what you can have during the fast, plain water, black coffee, nothing added plain tea. And I'm not talking about, you know, those fancy herbal teas that are like, you know, apple cinnamon delight, avoid those. You don't want anything that tastes like food or sweet sweetness or fruity. Um, sparkling water is fine as long as it's not flavored. So stick to very basic things like that. Black coffee, plain tea, plain water, plain sparkling water. Now let's talk about why. We have three fasting goals. And when you know what the fasting goals are, you can understand why it's important to fast clean. The first one is you want to keep your insulin low. You know, we talked about hyperinsulinemia is a problem. You know, insulin is not bad. We have to have it. You don't want to have high levels of circulating insulin all the time. It's linked to so many negative health outcomes. I didn't even really realize how many until when I was writing Fast Feast Repeat, I came across a research paper on hyperinsulinemia and it listed all the things that were associated with, with having chronic high levels of insulin. So this is so important for all of us. Um, so you want to avoid anything that is going to trick your body into thinking food is coming. Right. So for example, diet sodas, they're yeah. zero calorie. So we are like, well, it's zero calories. Nothing's happening. It has a zero effect. Well, it might have zero caloric effect, but it has effects in the body because you, you taste it. Your brain says, Ooh, sweetness is coming in. Our brains don't understand zero calorie sweeteners. Right. Our brains have developed with when you're eating something sweet, it's honey or it's an apple or it's an orange. And so you've got, you know, sugary sweetness coming in. And so we have the cephalic phase insulin response and our pancreas pumps out some insulin to deal with this hit of sugar that your body knows is coming in, except that it's not because you're having, you know, something with zero calories. So that leads to some, some metabolic confusion and it keeps your insulin high. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you keep that insulin high, you eventually will develop insulin resistance, all sorts of problems come along with that. So that's why we avoid anything food flavored. Um, you know, even something like apple cider vinegar, you know, I've experimented with that. My body thinks the food's coming in when I get a hot mug of hot water and put some apple cider vinegar in it, that that's my body's like, whoop, we're having apple cider vinegar. This is delicious. So you want to avoid anything that is delicious and food like during the fast, um, keep your insulin low. Um, the second fasting goal is we want to tap into our stored fat for fuel. So we do that by not adding fat into our coffee cup. Don't put in the butter, the MCT oil, because that's a huge source of energy. You know, yes, if you take exogenous ketones or chug MCT oil, your body will, will either have the ketones from the exogenous ketones or make ketones out of the MCT oil. But what it's not doing is making them from your stored fat. So our goal is not to have ketones and our goal is to make them. Right. So you only make them when you have to tap into your own fat stores for fuel. It's really amazing. I went through all that too, the, you know, putting stuff in my coffee, all the oils, the butters, whatever you re it really does. You know, at first it might feel satisfying, but over time it makes you hungrier. So I, I challenge everybody to try without it. You know, the third fasting goal is we want to have increased autophagy. Autophagy is our body's upcycling and recycling um, system. I mean, it happens yeah. naturally, but it happens when you're not digesting and eating. So, you know, if you're the person who puts your feet on the floor and starts eating and drinking all day long, like we've been trained to do in modern society, your body never has time to rest and clean and repair and autophagy, you know, isn't, isn't really happening. 
So we want to fast and have our bodies have time to, you know, we're not digesting, we're not eating. So our bodies have time to go in and rummage around and clean things up. Mm -hmm. Well, we do that by not taking in protein during the fast. So bone broth, for example, would not be something you would want to have. You know, it sounds fun, a bone broth fast, right? We've heard of them, but you're not actually fasting. That's a source of nutrients. It's a source of protein and your body is not going to need to rummage around, you know, in the, for the junkie proteins when you're taking in a source yourself. So avoid things like that. Yeah. I like how you, you know, there's the argument still out on a lot of this, right? Like autophagy is um, one of these things you keep hearing things about. Um, it's an amazing process that your body goes through. It's almost mm-hmm. like I equate it to um, taking your car and to get like, you know, oil change, right? Wheel, wheels aligned, um, you know, your body. It's amazing when you don't do anything as far as eating and let your gut rest and heal, like your body will heal on its own. Right. And uh, I like how you keep it black and white. And I think that's a good way to go because, you know, you, you hear a lot of these fasts where you're adding a bunch of fat and things like that. And, you know, I guess per se, if it's going to help you maybe in the beginning, get through some fasting, you know, perhaps, but like, like you said, like you just sort of got to deal with it. And I think the earlier that you just do a clean fast, like you mentioned, I think so. yeah, I think in, in the long run, it'll be easier. Well, in my, in my first book, Delay, Don't Deny, I was a little less emphatic about right. that and said, you know, you, yeah, you can try the cream until you adjust. It'll help you adjust. But I actually realized, you know, I've got almost half a million members in my Facebook groups um, that, that, you know, we're supporting through intermittent fasting. And we've actually realized over the years, Oh, those things don't actually make it easier. You're it actually delays the adjusting process. It makes it harder and longer for you to adjust. So I'm more of a fan of just rip off that band aid fast clean from day one. It'd be better to have a shorter fast, but train your body, you know, to fast clean from the first day And then gradually you can extend your fasting time as your body is adapted to it. But you fast clean from day one. I really think that makes a lot of difference. You know, if someone's listening and they've been, you know, like, well, I heard that I could put butter in my coffee and I heard that MCT oil actually made the fast better. It enhanced my results. I would like to challenge everybody to, to take the clean fast challenge. I have this in fast feast repeat, give yourself a month without whatever it is you've been using. Mm -hmm. just cold Turkey, you know, just say, all right, I'm this crazy gin. I'm going to try it. You know, Mm -hmm. see what she says. I'm going to stick to black coffee, plain tea, plain water, nothing added, no lemon, you know, nothing for flavor. I'm just going to stick to the plain. And then I'm going to see in a month, you know, then try putting it back in. And I bet you'll be a believer. Yeah. When you say plain tea, is Mm -hmm. green tea, Green tea, regular tea, black tea. There's a million kinds of actual, I mean, tea. They do a lot with the tea leaf, right? (laughs) Um, They, oolong tea. I mean, there's white tea, but there's so many different, different things that are actually real tea. But then we have all these things that are on the tea aisle that are not really tea. You know, like I wouldn't have, you know, um, chamomile tea during, during the fast because it doesn't have a bitter flavor profile. The key is, you know, when I was researching for fast feast repeat, I'm like, how do I really make the distinction so people understand? The key right. is bitter flavor profile. I read a study on flavors and what the different flavors do. You know, like a sour flavor causes your body to anticipate certain things and you start the salivary response, right? So we have the sweet flavor. I talked about the cephalic phase insulin response, a salty flavor on its own, like just like salt is okay. Just, you know, put a little salt in, um, even in water. water. You can, yeah. I don't, I don't do it. I don't like it, but yeah. some people do, especially in the keto world, um, minerals don't break the fast, but a bitter flavor is not associated by our bodies with like, you know, huge influx of calories, insulin needed. And that's why black coffee and plain tea, um, make the okay list for the clean fast. Now, if someone drinks them and every time you have the, um, you know, the bitter coffee, the bitter tea, you find yourself hungry, you're shaky, whatever experiment with leaving them out. Maybe you need to be a water only faster. But for me, I read a study um, about autophagy and coffee that talked about how coffee actually increases the the processes of autophagy. And I actually heard the lead researcher, he was an autophagy researcher. I heard him on a podcast and he said that he drinks black coffee during his fast. I'm like, well, if a person who is researching Mm. autophagy (laughs) thinks black coffee is great during the fast. That's good enough for me. So 
Right. And, and I did a short podcast on black coffee. And I will say, if you are going to do black coffee, really find where your beans are, are being sourced because mm-hmm. it's the most yes. highly like um, conventional crop that's with pesticides all over. <laughs> yeah. I use organic coffee and I grind my beans myself. And yeah, that, that's, I think, a very important. Yeah. And um, maybe let's talk a little bit about the differences um, between men and women in fasting, do you, you know, are there some, have you found through just through your, you know, you're interviewing other individuals and women and men, um, do you find there's some differences and in, in different approaches that they should take? I personally, you know, have not found that women are, you know, such fragile flowers that we can't do intermittent fasting, you know, in, in any style that you want to, it, with one caveat, you know, our bodies don't respond well to over restriction. Of course, men's bodies don't respond well to over restriction either. Over restriction is not good for us long term, metabolically or hormonally. But, you know, so that's the one thing women need to be cautious about because, you know, a lot of us have been champion dieters for, you know, decades. And so you start intermittent fasting and think, woo, I'm going to also really restrict my calories and I'm going to diet within my eating window. And so that can turn into too much restriction, which is not good for our bodies. But, you know, no matter how you're eating, too much restriction is not good for our bodies. So that's, you know, my book is not called fast, eat some diet meals, repeat. It's (laughs) fast, feast, repeat. You know, you need to eat to satiety. You don't want your body to think that you're starving. As long as you do that, I I think women will be just fine. Yeah. And one thing I notice with fasting too, is when, when I am eating, you fill up quicker. You do. (laughs) And, and it's like, you're like, wow, I don't need to eat more. Like, it's like, I don't, I'm not a counting calories person. Like you said, you know, eat till you're sort of satisfied. Um, And it's amazing. Like the more you do it, it's like, wow, I don't need to really eat as much as I was really eating. (laughs) It's true. And, you know, our, our bodies are looking for nutrients. Food quality really does matter with that. If you're eating highly nutritious foods and your body is getting the nourishment that it needs, it's not going to feel like you're overly restricting it. But if you're eating like diet bars and diet shakes and all of that, you know, we, we, again, you know, I talked about it with the artificial sweeteners. You, you can't fool mother nature, right? Our, <laughs> these, mm-hmm. these fake foods just do not, do not work in our bodies. You know, we're not designed to, you know, we're not getting the nutrients that we need, even in like a vitamin, you know, the, the stuff that's in real food, the phytochemicals, we don't even know what all that is doing. Right. So we've isolated a few that we think are important, but we don't even know what else is in there. So real foods, they, they make you feel full and they give your body what, what you need. Yeah. And, um, a, a few interviews I've had with, um, Ted Naiman and a few mm-hmm. other individuals, uh, you know, regarding the importance of protein. Right. Uh, and, you know, I think there's this, you know, there's this fear around protein with women. It, do you find this like that? They they're scared to like have a steak. Um, I think that we're scared of everything now. <laughs> I mean, it's really almost, I don't want to say that it's funny because it's really more sad than anything, but I'm trying to get into Instagram. I've not been on Instagram. I'm on Jen Stevens on Instagram. If anybody wants to follow me, you'll see pictures of my cats and mm-hmm. I would, <laughs> yeah, know, I checked it out. I'm yeah. not that exciting, but go to Jen Stevens and find me on Instagram. But, you know, because for some reason, Instagram has figured out I'm like in the health and wellness space. So it shows me everything health and wellness. Mm. And it's like, it's bizarre how, the different things that come up, eat only meat, eat no meat, eat only plants, eat, don't eat these plants. I mean, every other post is like telling you the opposite of the Mm -hmm. one before it. So, you know, even with protein, there's so much confusing, confusing information out there. You know, I've got one book on my shelf called proteinaholic that tells us we're killing ourselves with eating too much protein. I have another book on my shelf called protein power that says eat more protein. Mm -hmm. So um, you're right that it's confusing. Um, I love the protein leverage hypothesis. You know, that's Ted Naiman right there, right? Right. That's, mm-hmm. He uses that wording, I believe. Yeah. And that our bodies search for a certain amount of protein and our bodies know more than we do. You know, instead of you trying to count it, eat protein until you're satisfied and that's how much you need. Right. Um, one other thing about intermittent fasting and autophagy that I talked about before, our body is great at recycling proteins during the fast. So some of your protein needs are being met internally um, through, you know, the recycling of the protein you have. But I I know that if I don't eat enough protein, I'm not satisfied. 
you know, I get a lot right. of my protein from beans and things like that. I do eat meat. You know, last yeah. night I said I had a big steak and it was delicious, but right. you know what? I had that big piece of filet mignon and I probably ate, um, I don't know, three fourths of it. And then I was like, mm, that's enough of that. And I put it on my husband's plate and he finished it. So. Yeah. I mean, you know, nutrient density, um, I just had uh, another guy, Marty Kendall, which he I was, love him. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was great, and he's all about nutrient density. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, his big thing is is like you know really, yes, you can. There are some plants that are nutrient dense, but you have to eat so much of it that you know a lot of nutrient density. Your best bet is best bang for your buck. I would say is good quality fish mm -hmm. and you know grass fed meat. And, yeah. Um, <clears throat> he's coming on my podcast soon. I'm really excited to talk to him. I've read a lot of the things that he's put out there. In fact, I've been following his blog, optimizing nutrition for, mm -hmm. you know, ever since I did think I stumbled across it in 2017 when I was writing for feast without fear. Um, the whole premise of feast without fear, by the way, is that we're all different when it comes to what foods work for us, right. because, you know, being in, in face, the Facebook world and the diet space, people would come in and have giant arguments you know, if you're going to do intermittent fasting, you must be keto. Or if you're going to do intermittent fasting, you must be plant-based and people would have huge arguments. I'm like, why are we so confused? And it really does come down to, we are all different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it depends where you're coming from as well. I think if you're like, it, like a lot with my clients, if, if they're eating like highly processed foods and they're, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, they want to, you know, just like get on, get, start cleaning up their eating. That might be a first place to start, you know, start cleaning up the things that you're eating. And then you can start incorporating some fasting after that. Um, I guess you could put one before the other, but I either, did it the opposite way. Okay, you I, did. Did, <laughs> I did because, you know, as I, as I mentioned, I'd been on that diet train right. for so long that for me, I had really tried every way of eating that came out prior to 2014, because I was desperate. If something new came out, I tried it you know, anything that came out after 2014, thank goodness <laughs> I haven't had to try. But before then I did them all. And I was so weary from trying to change what I was eating that for me, I didn't, I just, I just did intermittent fasting and I continued to drive through the golden arches. I continued to eat whatever I wanted to eat. And the weight slowly started to come off. Mm -hmm. Amazingly though, over time, my body started asking for different foods. So I naturally gravitated towards eating, you know, now I'm eating mostly organic grass fed meat. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm, my 2014 self wouldn't even recognize who I am now. I, I'm not avoiding the drive through because of what I know about health. I'm avoiding it because it doesn't appeal to me as much. Yeah. And also if you're only having one or two meals a day, Mm -hmm. which is pretty much what I'm not, I'm assuming you have what, right. Yeah. So if you're only having one or two meals a day, you really want to make sure that meal is satiating and you're mm -hmm. putting in quality fuel. Um, and like you said, like, yeah, I, another way to do it would be, you know, start maybe pushing back your eating hours a little bit and, 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 um, condensing when you're eating. And then you'll start to realize that God, I'm, well, I'm, I only have like, for example, yesterday, I, I was gonna, I just decided to just do one meal and I just did it. And I, start eating at five o'clock, but you know, it's like, you make sure you ought to make sure you have good, good food in there. Cause you oh, yeah. know that, that you're not going to, you know, have it for a little while. It has to be window worthy. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, what about, uh, extended fasts? Do you do, do you occasionally mix in some extended fasts? I do not. Okay. And I am not an extended fast. Um, I don't want to say I'm not a proponent of an extended fasting because I believe there's a place for them. You know, I, I think extended fasting would be for healing. Now, first of all, let's talk about what would we define as extended fasting? Cause there's a lot of confusion with that. Some people think if you go 24 hours, you're extended fasting. And actually I, I don't think so. We have, um, you know, time restricted eating, which is the daily eating window mm -hmm. approach that probably is what you do most of the time. It's what I on, only do now. Then we've got alternate day fasting protocols every other day, fa you know, things like that, um, where you might go 36 to 42 hours. And we call that those are alternate daily fasting protocols. So I don't consider those to be extended fasts because, you know, they're, they're based on the, the terminology is alternate day fasting, not extended fasting. So I think if you're eating every other day with those protocols, you know, you have a 
you know, the 36 hour fast and you have what we call an up day where you're eating all day. Then you repeat that back and forth. Or even if you only have two of those a week, you know, like a five, two approach, probably a lot of people have heard of those. Mm -hmm. That would be two of those, you know, 36 to 42 hour fasts per week. Those are not extended fasts. But when you get beyond the alternate daily fasting protocols, that's where you're getting into um, extended fasting territory. And I think the, the thing to be careful is about is we can overfast for our bodies. You know, I talk about this in Fast Feast Repeat. You know, this is not the fasting Olympics. We tend to, you know, get caught up into, wow, if, if fasting is good, then more fasting, more and more and more must be better, better, better. And, you know, that's not always the case. I talk about a study, you know, and also I will be honest with you, the studies on extended fasting, as you start getting beyond the alternate day realm, there are not very many out there, you know, and especially not, you know, studies on doing that repeatedly, you know, what's our body going to do with that? We do have one study that I um, refer back to, and it's a study of a 72 hour fasting period. And they followed people through the 72 hour fast, you know, keeping in mind, these are not people who had been, you know, doing a ton of fasting. So these are like, you know, virgin people who are starting off right with oh, the 72 hour quite fast. A way to start. Yeah, yeah exactly. I would not but recommend they, that. I no, recommend. no, I wouldn't either. But um, the metabolism was interesting when they measured the metabolic rate to the participants, you know, let, you know, they had a baseline metabolic rate, let's just say, then as they followed them over the course of the 72 hours, their metabolic rate actually went up, 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 up. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point it peaked and then it began on the downward trajectory. Okay. And this was just over one 72 hour period. So at our 72, the metabolic rate was still higher than it had been at baseline, but it was on the downward trajectory. So what does that show us? Well, that shows us that eventually there's going to come a point when your body's like, Ooh, literally nothing is coming in. It's time to slow some things down. Mm -hmm. I have a hunch that's going to be different for everybody. You know, like we can't say, Oop, that happens at our X, Y, Z, you right. know, <laughs> it's going to be different. All these things are averages when they do these studies with, you know, multiple people. But, um, you know, if you're doing too much fasting, your body is going to slow down your metabolic rate. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just the way it is. Our bodies want to protect us and nothing coming in is like, okay, time to slow some things down. Yeah. And, and it depends on the person. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I, I just interviewed a guy, Larry Diamond. It was a great interview with a fasting method and he's a health coach on there. Right. He lost like 120 pounds and he did this through fasting um, and cleaning up his eating, but um, he does do occasional extended fasts. Um, and he, maybe three, so he does like a three, three day and then a five day. Um, and you know, for someone that maybe is in that, you know, in, in that obese range, um, this could be an effective method. Um, you know, someone who's underweight or at where they want to be. Oh yeah, definitely should not. Yeah. Should probably not, you know, for me, for example, like I'm where I'm, where I want to be, but you know, I've been doing fasting for a while. Sometimes I like to do a few days just to sort of, you know, it, it, it's, you know, just a challenge, more of a mental thing than anything, you know, I haven't skipped a day of eating since, um, 2016. Oh, <laughs> I've eaten okay. every day. I don't, I don't do longer fasts and, okay. you know, I haven't needed to, to, you know, stay in my maintenance range where I feel great. Um, now if I had a health issue that I felt that fasting would, um, would help me with. Of course, I would do that under medical supervision. I really believe that if you're going to do fasts beyond 72 hours, you really want to be under medical supervision. You know, there was a movie that I watched a, a couple years ago, fasting. It's on, I think it's Amazon prime. You can watch it there. Okay. And they have these clinics that they follow people going through, you know, Russia, I think. And one there's of the a clinic States. in Germany. I thought mm -hmm. I watched. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, one thing I love about that, that, um, that movie is, you know, it's a documentary is that first of all, they're so, you know, strong on the health benefits of fasting. You know, they have decades of using this with, yeah. with people for healing purposes, but I love that they emphasize that you must be under medical supervision that at no time during that movie, which loves fasting. Did they say, try it at home? You no, know, <laughs> if you're going to do longer fasts, especially if you have health conditions, you really need to be um, you know, under some sort of supervision, don't just try to go it alone. Um, 
you know, the refeeding is so very important. You could actually harm yourself by refeeding incorrectly after a long fast when your digestive system has been, you know, at rest, you know, go, going to have like a slice of pizza, you could damage your, um, I mean, that's not a good thing. So right. you got to be really careful with refeeding. So I do not guide anybody past the alternate daily fasting approach. That's, that's where I believe that, you know, the lifestyle and the healing really can come in for, for most of us. But if you want to do longer fasts, then I would find, you know, some sort of medical professional to support you through that. And there really is a danger of over fasting, you know, people who are really, um, you know, the rip off the bandaid, like I said, they're like, well, I'm just going to fast until the weight is gone. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't yeah. recommend that. <laughs> no, you know, fasting is a stressor. I mean, you definitely want it to is. ease your way into it. Yes. You know, if you've been doing it for years and years and years, and you want to do a few days, you know, yeah, again, you, you can get supervision, but you know, um, you definitely listen want to your body. Yeah. Listen to your body. Yeah. Worst comes to worst. If you, if you're not feeling right, you can always, <laughs> can exactly. Always, can always break it. If you feel and, really unwell, listen to your body. If you feel shaky or nauseous or, right. you know, you're don't just feel like, well, I can push through that. No, that, that might be the wrong thing to push through. Right. You can push through hunger cues, right. Yes. But pushing through yeah. that. Yeah. And, and as far as breaking the fast, um, what would you rec- what do you recommend for people starting out as far as breaking a fast? Well, really that's going to be different for, for everybody, depending on your body. You know, obviously, you know, as I mentioned real foods, high quality foods, that's always going to satisfy you the best. You know, I do not, um, break my fast with, you know, a whole bunch of ultra processed cookies or something mm-hmm, that would, right. I would feel terrible. You know, anything that, you know, real quick load to the, the you know, the bloodstream, jacking up that blood sugar and then it's going to crash, then you're going to feel awful. So, you know, I wouldn't go have a sugary latte to open my window. I do well yet with, you know, like real foods. Yeah, no real foods. And I actually, like you mentioned, like soup is a a good way to break, even like a bone broth, um, just to sort of wake up the digestive system. And and especially, you know, if someone who does alternate daily fasting, you know, something like starting with some bone broth to open your window on the up day can be good because sometimes people have a little digestive, um, Uh, upset let's just say Mm -hmm. if you start to to um aggressively so waking up that digestive system silly i don't have that problem but i've you know heard about it from lots of people who do so start with something like a you know bone broth would be great to open your window um yeah i tend to have different things that i gravitate to depending on the season like right now it's winter and i'm gravitating towards the soups you know i have um, a company that i like to get these they have these bowls that come and i love to cook from scratch but i don't have time to do it all day long so i found this company that has these wonderful soup bowls you know with heavy with the beans and the kale and the tomatoes and garlic and things i love so i can just microwave that and have it and then make my dinner later but in the summer i might want to have some guacamole and you know something like that maybe some hummus have you tried or, a, have you tried using an instant pot I actually have one. Yeah, okay. I'm not the Instant Pot brand. I have the Pampered Chef Instant okay. Pot version and I love it. Um, yeah, but yeah. I, I, you know, if I'm making a big batch of chili, I'll use that. Right. Rice is great in it. Yeah, yeah. So easy. I almost feel like so it's easy. like d- dumb proof. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. could like throw like half the kitchen in there and something will come out. You're like, oh, this is good. <laughs> it's true. Um, <clears throat> what about like mindset? Um. I was interviewed uh, Drew Manning, the fit, fat, fit uh, guy who's uh, now going back into a fit mode, and um, he he touched a lot about mindset. What what do you think? Uh, what type of things do you think people need to you know? Because we can talk about fasting all we want. For a lot of mm-hmm. people, that can be a very uh, big step to do. Um, what goes? What what type of advice do you give people if they're just starting out as far as mindset's concerned? That's a great question. I think mindset is really the key to success, really for anything that you're doing, you you know, having, having the right mindset. I have a chapter in fast feast repeat about mindset and it is my favorite chapter Mm. in the whole book. And, um, you know, the research on mindset is solid. You know, um, I first read about it, Carol Dweck, I'm sure you're familiar with her book mindset. (laughs) That's the name of it. Um, and she, you know, I actually heard her speak at the national gifted conference. Um, maybe, I don't know, 2012, I can't remember when it was 2013, somewhere around in there. I was a teacher for 28 years Mm -hmm. and I have a doctorate in gifted education. So I went to the national gifted conference. Carol Dweck was the keynote speaker. She talked about growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And, you know, the research of course is applicable to our, 
you know, our classroom work with students, but it really applies to everything. And it applies to intermittent fasting as well. If you go into intermittent fasting with the mindset, this is going to be hard. I'm probably going to fail. I'm probably not going to be able to do it. It's not going to work for me. Then probably you're right. Yeah. You know, if you go into it, understanding the science behind it, you know, which is why that's how I start fast feast repeat with the science so that you understand the benefits. If you go into it, understanding, wow, it's linked to great health outcomes. It's linked to longevity. Wow. It's, it's, you know, good for my body. And also I can lose some fat and, and it's going to work for me. And, you know, I can tweak what I'm eating. I can change up my fasting and it's going to work then, then it will work for you. Um, it's always working in your body, but you know, we have some studies in there. I, I talked about belief is important. Like just, you know, to, to summarize one study, there were some um, hotel workers who cleaned hotel rooms and they told one group that the, the work they did to clean hotel rooms was all the physical exercise they needed in a day. And then they told the other group something else. What They didn't tell them that. Um, but the group that was told you cleaning these hotel rooms is your physical activity for the day. And it's good for you. They actually lost weight, had good health outcomes mm-hmm. because they believed that they probably cleaned a little differently because they're like, I'm working out my arm, you know, mm-hmm. but th- they had a different mindset. And so that changed the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, yeah. And just like, um, I also think as far as mindset's concerned, like the simplicity of of, you know, fasting. I know you talk about clean fast, but yeah, it's like, like you said, there's so much confusion out there that the one thing that fasting brings you back to that can help sort of get your mind around it is the fact that it's pretty black and white, right? You know, yes, there are some little details here and there, but for the most part, if you keep it simple, you'll follow it for a longer time period. I think so fast, clean, you know, stop looking for, can I have this? What about mushroom tea? What about this? What about the other? Stop trying to work things into the fast, just fast, clean, black coffee, plain tea, plain water, sparkling water, stick to basics, let your body do what it needs to do. You can have any of those fancy things you want later. Mm-hmm. You know, the fast should not be a flavor adventure. The fast is supposed to be kind of boring. It's your body working, you know, doing things behind the scenes. You can do things, stay busy, you know, get, stay busy. get, um, yeah, yeah get, get things a- accomplished that I'm my most productive in the fasted state. And then later enjoy all those things that that taste good to you put the cream in your coffee and your eating window and enjoy it (laughs) yeah it does make you appreciate it Mm -hmm. i remember reading um a book uh, it was a book uh seamland he's got a lot of fasting um books and metabolic autophagy and things out there and um he just talked about how there's a lot of people out there kids adults you know, third world countries, and they go to bed hungry every night, they abstain from food, and they don't know where their next meal is coming from. And I think that it shows a little bit of like, um, you know, mental, uh, let's say mental power, or a little bit of discipline that you can skip a meal and everything Mm -hmm. will be okay. And it sort of makes you really appreciate the times when you are eating. And not only will everything be okay, but you're, you know, you learn to cherish the fasting time and the value in that. And that's an important part of the mindset as well. Instead of thinking of the fast as something you have to get through so that you can eat, you appreciate that you feel so great and your body is doing all this important work. And so then you protect that time. And I wouldn't want to, you know, lose out on those benefits. So why would I, you know, I mean, those, that, that time is valuable and, and precious to me and I cherish it. Yeah. And one of the questions I like to ask my guests because we're getting up on the hour here is, um, and we've probably hit on it already, but what would be one tip you'd give man or woman if they, you know, let's say they're middle-aged, they want to get their body back to what it once was like five, 10, 15 years ago. What, what one tip would you give them to get, to get started? Well, I really think that intermittent fasting is, you know, going to be the tool in the toolbox that helps you more than anything else. And again, notice I said it is a tool in the toolbox because some people, you know, they start with intermittent fasting and they realize they're not losing weight as quickly as they thought they would. They may need to, you know, change up what they're eating, especially, you know, how I mentioned before that 
our, our bodies are different when it comes to what foods work with us, work for us. And also you may be in a really, you know, poor state of health overall. And so if you're in a really poor state of health, if your gut's a mess, you may need to clean things up to heal. Right. And so healing is important. So, you know, if you've been eating the standard American diet for, you know, 50 years, then you may need to really focus on nutrition too, because that's also an important part of the puzzle. Um, I have a time in fast feast repeat called the 28 day fast start. And I encourage people to start off, you know, however is right for you. There are three different approaches you can, you can choose from. There's like a quiz you can take to see which is right for you. Do you want to ease in, you know, are you more in the middle or are you going to rip off the bandaid? but you can go back and forth at all times. You don't have to like say, well, I'm going to rip off the band aid," Then you're stuck with that. You know, you can ease up if you need to, mm-hmm. but I encourage people, even as I just said that you may need to change your food quality over time. I encourage people not to do that during the first 28 days because that's really a recipe for failure. Changing everything at once is, is not sustainable and you're going to feel bad and you're going to be like, I can't do this. This is stupid. And then before you know it, you're not fasting and you're not eating good Mm -hmm. foods. You're doing nothing because we've all been there. So instead, you know, when you start intermittent fasting, keep eating the way you have been most recently eating. That goes both ways. Let's say for the past two years, you've been eating really clean keto. And now you're like, I'm sick of this. I want to have more variety in my food. So I'm going to start intermittent fasting and I'm going to reintroduce all the things. Mm. That's also a bad idea. Right. You don't want to all of a sudden eat 100% clean or go to 100% dirty. I mean, I don't like to say dirty, but you know what I mean. Yeah. You get what I'm saying. So stick with how you were most recently eating. Do one thing. Mm. That first 28 days, you're adjusting to the clean fast and letting your body learn how to do that. Then you can start to tweak, you know, what you're eating. And also, you know, I would encourage people not to expect weight loss at all for the first 28 days. Mm. Don't expect it. I don't even want you to wait. Weigh on day zero, take measurements, take photos, then put all that away for the next 28 days. (laughs) Then on day 29, consider that to be your baseline. On day 29, hopefully you've adjusted to the fasting. Weigh again. It might be higher than it was on day zero. That's okay. Your measurements might be up. You might look puffier, but start there. And then you can start weighing every day, working on, you know, start comparing progress photos and measurements. And you should expect to see the overall trend slowly, you know, going down, but it's not quick weight loss. This is not one of those things where, you know, when, when I first was putting the book together and we were selling it to the publishers, you know, my agent was like, all right, let's see, you know, we were calling it something else other than 28 day fast start. I think the 21 day something or other, but um, I decided to make it be 28 because that's more realistic, but they're like, all right, now what can we tell them how much they should expect to lose during mm-hmm. that first? And I'm like, nothing. nothing. They're like, oh, that right. doesn't sound exciting. <laughs> I'm like, well, t- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> congratulations. You're not going to lose anything. Welcome right. to the program. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. But you know, uh, I, I like what you say, because it is, a you know, the whole goal is to make it a lifestyle change. Right. And if you're just thinking you're going to get these results over a month and then you're just going to move on, then you're not. Just don't even do it. Yeah. you're yeah. <laughs> it, That's that's not why you do intermittent fasting. It's not a quick weight loss plan. It's not something you do. And, and it's also not something you start and stop. You know, I, I actually first learned about intermittent fasting in 2009 and I wasn't successful at making it my lifestyle until 2014 when I weighed 210 pounds. It never quote worked for me before. Of course, I didn't understand fasting clean. I was putting all that stuff that you could, should not have. I was having it, but I also would go on and off and on and off. And so my body never adjusted. Like I might do it for four days in a row. Then I would take six days off. Then I would try to do it again. I never got fat adapted. I never got to the point where my body was metabolically flexible. I was trapped in the adjustment period nonstop. Mm -hmm. You know, so for anybody who's ever tried it, like I used to do, if you weren't fast and clean, if you were starting and stopping and you were like, well, that didn't work and it was awful and I hated it. Well, that's why you never let your body adjust and you were trapped in the hardest part perpetually, but I promise it gets better. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned like being, become fat adapted right? and and that can take time, especially if you have 30, 40 years of habits that have not been good. Um, 
could take more like hyperinsulinemia, you know, you got to bring that insulin down and you're not going to be an efficient, you know, tapping into your fat stores until you have time gone by. Right. Well, this was great, Jen. That went by fast. It did. <laughs> um, well, awesome. Well, we'll definitely look out for your, while well, your book's out, check it out fast f- feast repeat. Right. Um, and uh, where's the best place to find you? Well, if you go to jenstevens.com, Jen is G-I-N, Stevens with a P-H, you can mm-hmm. find links there to everything that I'm doing. I have the Intermittent Fasting Stories podcast, um, and so you can listen to Brian and mm-hmm. others tell their, while, yeah. it, it has been that your episode was great. You know, we still pull that one out when people are like, can I work out in the fasted state? We're like, oh. listen to Brian. <laughs> Yes, you can. Oh, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we, yours is one we pull out and, and share with people and you, know, you can listen to the people's stories. They're all different, but they will inspire you in so many ways. And then I also have the intermittent fasting podcast with um, co-host Melanie Avalon, and we answer questions and get a little more into the nitty gritty of the science of it. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm boring on Instagram, but if you like <laughs> cats, <laughs> no. And also I have a picture of myself in the sauna, you know, I'm trying. Right, right. Hey, you know what? <laughs> Social media is not for everybody. I'm not. No. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. Well, thank I'm like you. Looking for- at all these things people are doing and these videos, I'm like, yeah, I can't do all that. <laughs> right, like these Instagram reels and no, all. That. Yeah. No. Um. Well, thanks again, Jen. Well, thank you, Brian. I really enjoyed it. A lot of great info. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine and I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.